Hi, Craig. Hi, Carl. How are you doing? Good. Um, let me just uh, do a little introduction about you for blogging heads and people who may not be familiar with you. Um, so I'm talking today with Craig Venter. And uh, Craig first uh, became well-known uh, in the 1990s for his project to uh, sequence the human genome. And uh, he's, you may have recalled him uh, on the White House lawn where President Bill Clinton in 2000 uh, declared that um, a rough draft of the human genome had been completed. And now seven years later, uh, Craig is the director of the J. Craig Venter Institute in Rockville, Maryland, where I believe he is talking from. And last month there, uh, scientists published uh, what many consider the, the gold standard in human genomes, which just so happens to be Craig's genome. Uh, Craig has also overseen the sequencing of the genomes of dozens of other species, and he's also at the forefront of uh, basically creating artificial life. Um, he and his colleagues may be on the verge of building an artificial genome and being able to successfully put it in a cell. So it may not be creating life from scratch, but it's pretty close. Uh, and Craig has also published a memoir, which I have right here, called A Life Decoded. So, Craig, thanks for coming to Blogging Heads. Well, good to be with you. As you can see, it's been a busy year for us. Uh, yeah, it certainly has. It's just busy trying to keep up. Um, so I just wanted to start by talking to you about this genome. Um, so how is it that you ended up publishing this genome, in particular your genome, for all the, the world to look at? Well, it actually started back in 98 with the effort at Celera, and we had to make some decisions early on about whose genome to sequence. Uh, we also needed to make a number of DNA libraries and get going on things, and uh, there was a heated debate around the time uh, most people, particularly on the government side, were stressing secrecy and anonymity, uh, that there was huge dangers to have your genome sequenced, uh, it was sort of a climate of fear. Uh, everybody was worried what might happen to people who had their genome sequenced, particularly if it was disclosed. And uh, my view of leadership is not to push people out in front of you, uh, but to lead. And I figured it was better to uh, convince people I felt it was okay to have my genome sequenced by uh, going ahead and doing that instead of urging somebody else to give it a try. Uh, also, I can't imagine a scientist working in this field uh, not have any curiosity uh, to try and help interpret the genome by relating uh, their own experience to it. So it was a combination of those things. Uh, my DNA uh, comprised about 60% uh, uh, of the Solera sequence. Uh, and uh, when it was clear uh, to us that we missed a lot of genetic variation, in the assembly that we did uh, of the human genome. We had five people whose genomes contributed, uh, and we did a, the software did a majority rule that basically subtracted out a lot of the unique variants to any one's genome. Uh, so I think what we did was flawed from that point of view. Uh, in contrast, the public effort was flawed for a different reason. Uh, they only did a haploid genome, half of the genome, uh, because they selected a, a number of just uh, individual uh, clones, uh, by definition having only one copy of, uh, of anything in their sequence. And it was a composite of maybe 200 or more people, uh, but each, it was a mosaic quilt, uh, each section just being half, of a genome from that segment. So both projects were flawed, uh, uh, and we knew uh, that we had missed out on a lot of genetic variation. We just didn't know how much. Uh, and so we spent, uh, starting in 2002, a whole new project to really do a thorough analysis of one genome. Seeing that we already had substantial data uh, from the Celera effort, we started with that and reanalyzed it, and then added a great deal of more sequence here at the Venture Institute. So um, for you, uh, aside from sort of the personal interest, what's the most interesting thing to come out of looking at a, a full genome, that is a genome that has the chromosomes of both of your parents in it? 
I think the biggest single surprise is how much any two humans differ from one another. Uh, when I look just at uh, the two sets of parental chromosomes that I have, when we look at all the types of genetic variation, uh, my two sets of chromosomes differ by as much as a half a percent. If we're comparing my genome to yours, that might differ by as much as one to two percent because we're basically uh, comparing four chromosome sets with any two people. Uh, that's a very different view than came out of 2000, 2001, where the mantra was we all had the same exact sets of genes, and we were looking at just point minor variations in those genes to explain all of humanity. Uh, it didn't seem right at the time, but until we could get the complete uh, data, uh, it was hard to challenge. So we're just seeing a lot more variation then? Well, in fact, uh, we thought in the literature had uh, humans differing from chimpanzees by 1.27%. Uh, we, in fact, differ by, from each other far more than that, and we're probably 5 to 6% different from chimpanzees when you account for all the indels and genetic variation. Uh, where genes line up, uh, we have some highly conserved sequences that are maybe 1% or less different between us and chimps. But when you look at the whole genetic code, the whole genome, uh, we're much more different than people thought. Hmm. Hmm. Um, now, people are really interested in human genomes for medical applications. So there are a lot of stories these days about um, your personal genome and how that might be able to uh, help you in terms of your health. But, um, I mean, at this point, with what we know about um, disease and about genes and so on, um, how much can you really learn about your health from looking at your genome that you couldn't actually learn, say, from your family history? No, that's a great question. In fact, we're still just learning how to read the genetic code and interpret it. Uh, many people thought that reading the six billion letters of genetic code was the end point. Uh, I always argued that it was a race to the starting line because we now have to, we have this vast code, we have to learn how to interpret it, what it means about biology, about evolution, uh, about ourselves. Uh, there's some things we can clearly uh, read and interpret now because there's been in some areas, for example, heart disease, uh, extensive genetic studies. Uh, other areas, uh, you know, are, are much less well studied. Uh, but in this era of double-digit inflation for uh, health insurance, uh, preventative medicine is one of the few things, I think, that gives us hope for the future of having uh, ability to know what we're at risk for, uh, maybe as in the case of heart disease or what I'm doing by uh, changing diet and lifestyle, <coughs> taking a statin, uh, maybe... Uh, overcome what would be considered by some to be a genetic destiny. Uh, with other diseases, it really depends on the disease. Uh, certainly with, uh, if there's a genetic risk for cancer, uh, the data with colon cancer is pretty uh, overwhelming in the sense that if the cancer is detected before their symptoms, uh, there's greater than a 90% chance of a 10-year survival. Treatment is pretty straightforward with surgery. Uh, it's not a huge impact if it's detected after symptoms occur and if it's detected because of those symptoms, survival goes down to less than five years uh, for the majority of people, the expense goes way up. So having hints early on uh, help give each of us as individuals a little bit more power and control over our, <coughs> excuse me, our own life outcomes. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, in terms of the um, the cost of, of doing these genomes, I mean, it's still pretty expensive now. Um, do you have a sense of, you know, when personal genomes would be something that would be really practical? I mean, people talk about like a $1,000 price tag is really making making that happen. I mean, what's your sense of when that we might be seeing things like that? Well, the cost has been coming down exponentially if you look at a... Uh, multi-billion dollar federal program. Uh, the the Slara genome costs maybe a hundred million. Uh, when we look at uh, my personal genome, uh, <clears throat> because a lot of it was done at Slara, uh, probably the total cost of that, including what was done there, is probably 70 million. Uh, the company that uh, 
uh, claims to have sequenced uh, Jim Watson's genome, uh, claims they've done that for uh, a few million dollars, uh, but we're still waiting for the scientific publication to see how complete uh, and accurate that is, so it may not be an indication, but there's several exciting new technologies on the horizon. Uh, we're trying one that looks like it could be maybe $300,000 for a genome, and we're adding substantially to my genome sequence uh, with that technology, so we'll know by the end of the year whether it can really be done for that cost. I expect within a few years we'll be below $100,000 a genome. Uh, I expect within five years the X Prize, uh, the $10 million prize that we uh, helped put up uh, through the X Prize Foundation for new technology to drive the cost down uh, into the $1,000 range uh, and with very rapid technology uh, is hopefully will be awarded. So I think we're in a very rapid progression to the point that we've now set the goal of trying to do 10,000 human genomes over this next decade obviously starting uh, slower, but uh, uh, we now have uh, two genomes uh, done, and uh, we hope this next year 30 to 50 will be added to that. So uh, the mm -hmm. following year may be in the thousands. So we'll see how fast it scales up, but I, uh, this lag phase, uh, which is really quite remarkable, uh, between 2000 and what we just published this year, uh, for a small institution to be the only one doing human genomics right now uh, is pretty uh, stunning, and, and it's it's a sad state of uh, government-funded genome research that we don't have a lot of humans done already. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, just to switch gears a little bit, um, I, I'm really intrigued by uh, research that you and others have been publishing recently about the human genome that looks um, more at the parts of the genome that don't encode genes, or at least protein coding genes. Um, so, you know, we were all taught that uh, you got genes, which are made of DNA, and then they get copied into RNA, which then is used to make proteins. And sort of proteins is kind of the stuff of, of life that, that, that builds our bodies. Uh, but, of course, that only makes up about 2% of the genome, these protein-coding genes. And um, you and others have been looking at this other 98% and are finding that at least some of it is, may be having some, some interesting functions for us. And um, there was one paper I, I was wondering if maybe if we could talk a bit about where you were comparing the DNA of humans to the DNA of sharks. Uh, so could In you fact, describe it was the that? Yeah, it was the elephant shark, which is uh, mm -hmm. probably the the oldest uh, uh, shark that's out there, and, and certainly one of the uh, earliest uh, cartilaginous fish that we have a, a record of. Uh, no, it's really quite remarkable, and it, and it shows uh, the bizarre progression of science that uh, uh, People thought the, the only important part of the genome was, as you said, the protein-coding genes. And the arrogance went so far as to call the rest junk DNA, uh, as though it could all be discarded with. Uh, I always liked uh, Sidney Brenner, one of our key collaborators, uh, uh, who actually brought the elephant shark genome project to us, uh, who said there was a big difference between junk and rubbish. Uh, rubbish <laughs> you throw out, junk you store in your attic uh, until you know the purpose of it. So... Uh, I always knew that we would begin uh, to unravel what the other regions of the genome did. Uh, I never considered them junk or waste products, uh, but I think it's pretty exciting what's there in terms of everything from these regulatory RNA molecules that regulate gene expression uh, to uh, who knows what. Uh, it's really amazing in the study you're referring to in the elephant shark genome we found this tremendous conservation of the non-coding region of the elephant shark genome uh, it conserved in the human genome. So we're talking about uh, a, maybe a, a billion years of evolution. Uh, so those segments clearly did not stick around uh, if there was not genetic selection for them uh, as playing an important role in, in our uh, function. So. Uh, we have a very long way to go in understanding what's in our genetic code uh, and these simplistic notions uh, maybe that have come out of uh, 
what we did with bacterial genomes or just what people wanted to believe. It's, uh, it's clearly far more complex than just this parts list, this so-called book of life analogy that people have tried to use. So, um, so you might have uh, some of these RNA molecules that might be um, shutting down other genes or interfering with the production of proteins or helping other proteins be produced, Is this kind of network of regulation that's happening. Right. And also we have uh, areas that we you know are responsible for uh, chromosome folding and unfolding. And it turns out uh, with the human genome, it's the unfolding of the chromatin that actually allows uh, for the polymerases to, uh, uh, to copy the material uh, into RNA. So there's this tremendous regulation just at the structural level of our chromosomes uh, that unfold uh, as they're uh, being uh, leading to gene expression. So uh, I think it's going to be a, one of the most exciting parts of the next decade uh, as we uh, begin to continually uh, uncover new functions. I think the RNAIs, uh, the regulatory RNAs, these small molecules, uh, I think are one, certainly one of the most important discoveries uh, but we also know there's imprinting, uh, there's places where uh, despite uh, dominant and recessive genes, the, uh, the DNA that we inherit from one uh, parent or the other, uh, whether it's due to methylation or something else, uh, carries with it the much more significance uh, than the corresponding chromosome from the other parent. So uh, I, I think this is a very exciting era as we begin to unravel the human existence. When we can start to relate that to stem cell activity and stem cell regulation, uh, only then will we understand how we go from one uh, single cell uh, into 100 trillion cells uh, to form us as humans. And it's interesting how um, looking at the evolution of the human genome can help tell you what the human genome is actually doing. Well, in fact, uh, I, I've argued, as others have, is once we have uh, the genomes of several primates, uh, our team contributed to the rhesus monkey, we have the chimp genome, uh, we can start to now look at precise evolutionary events that might have taken place with our speciation, uh, which gene sets are different, uh, which stem cell regulatory factors, perhaps, uh, that led to our increased uh, cortical function, uh, maybe uh, areas that led uh, to speech. Uh, instead of having these be imaginary things, we can actually look at and do precise uh, experimental measurements of uh, how similar we are, uh, yet how different we are uh, from other primates. Mm. So um, let me switch gears from, from human life to artificial life. Um, I've been sort of curious um, about just when precisely you got the idea that maybe you would be able to do this. I mean, um, it's it's um, one thing to, to think, wouldn't it be neat to make a, a, a chromosome from scratch and see if you could bring it to life in a cell? But um, most people, I would think, at least until recently, would have just left it as kind of a hypothetical. So um, how far back would you say that you sat down and said, you know, I think I could do this? Well, there was a, a natural evolution of our thinking. Uh, and this all goes back to 1995 when my teams did the first two genomes in history. Uh, the first was Haemophilus influenzae, uh, roughly a 2 million base pair genome. Uh, and then right after that, in the same year, we did uh, a mycoplasma genitalium genome, which is the smallest genome of a self-replicating organism. And this and is a uh, this is like a microbe that it's uh, like a pathogen that lives in humans, is it? Well, it, it's a symbiont with humans. It's not clear whether mm -hmm. it actually causes disease, uh, okay. but it actually grows independently in culture. So we uh, grow it as a single self-replicating organism. It doesn't depend on humans, although it depends on a, a pretty rich medium because uh, uh, it threw out a lot of the genes for amino acid synthesis, uh, for example. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we just simply ask the questions of if one species needs 1,800 genes to live, another around uh, five or 600, uh, is it possible to define a genetic operating system for a cell, a minimal one? Uh, and we begin to do comparative genomics uh, in the computer. Uh, we then uh, spent several years doing uh, gene knockouts using uh, transposons. These are mobile genetic elements that can randomly insert in the genetic code. When they insert it in the middle of a gene, they disrupt its function. And mm -hmm. so we could, we could sequence exactly where those were. So uh, uh, there's a number of genes that can't tolerate any insertions because the cells die. Uh, so we deem those essential genes and the rest non-essential uh, if they could take transposon insertions. The trouble is you can only do those one at a time. Uh, you can't do them serially up to 100 or 200 genes. So, so you, have, only, you can only say, I know that this uh, microbe can't live without this one particular gene. That's right. And then you make a list. But okay. we have the list of all of them, but we found, uh, in fact... Uh, perhaps one of the most important findings that y you can't define a life form based on this genetic code alone. You need the genetics mm -hmm. plus the environment. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, an example is uh, there's two genes for uh, sugar transporters in mycoplasma, one for glucose and one for fructose. Uh, if you have both sugars in the media for the cell to grow on, you can knock out the gene for the fructose transporter uh, and the cell happily lives. So we would score that as a non-essential gene. But if you only have fructose in the media and no glucose, and you knock out the gene for the fructose transporter, the cell di dies. So with mm -hmm. that experiment, you would say that was an absolutely essential gene. So we don't know how many conditionally uh, uh, dependent uh, genes there are. We don't know because uh, over a hundred of the genes, even in this minimal cell, are still of unknown function. We don't know what role they play. All we know is several of them, if you knock them out, the cell dies. Uh, mm -hmm. So we don't know if you knock out one gene, if there's several others that compensate for its loss of activity. Uh, obviously, in humans, we have a large number of parallel pathways for things. So we decided the only way to truly uh, ascertain what a minimal uh, system would be, would be to uh, synthetically make the chromosome. Uh, and then we could uh, mix and match sets of genes, uh, leaving out all the ones that we could knock out, see if that resulted in a living cell. But we don't even know basic fundamentals about genomics in terms of how important is gene order. Uh, are they just components as long as we have uh, the right four or 500 genes in the chromosomes uh, will get a living cell. Um, you know, so there's a lot of fundamental questions that we thought we could answer by making a synthetic chromosome. Uh, but before we even started the, the first research, uh, we commissioned a year and a half long bioethical review at the University of Pennsylvania uh, that was published uh, by them in 1999 in Science saying that they thought we were taking reasonable approaches uh, and that we should proceed uh, with our experiments. Their only caveat was concern about potential uh, biological warfare uses of this new technology that we would be developing as we went on to make a synthetic cell. Mm -hmm. I see. So, I can describe um, the next steps as well to you because it, it was sure. a long a long path. Um, yeah. We actually set out after that time, uh, we thought we'd start with a bacterial virus, uh, bacterial phage, Phi X174, uh, both because of its historical significance. Uh, this was the uh, truly the first uh, genome. Uh, it was one that Fred Sanger and his team uh, had sequenced. Uh, but it's not a, viruses are not living entities, uh, so Haemophilus was the first living entity. Uh, but it turns out uh, the, uh, the, every letter of the genetic code in Phi X174 uh, is probably essential and essential that it be uh, accurately uh, made. So we figured that would be a great test uh, for our ability to try and accurately make uh, synthetic DNA. Uh, in fact, we tried this in the 1990s, uh, just ordering all the oligos uh, 
Uh, uh, we could, you, just... could you explain what an oligo is? So uh, an oligonucleotide is just a stretch of synthetic DNA that can be readily made off of DNA synthesizers. We made pieces on the order between uh, 30 letters and 80 letters or 80 base pairs long uh, with overlaps with the next piece, uh, sort of like Legos, uh, mm-hmm. thinking if we just uh, made all these pieces and put them together and copied them with the enzyme uh, a DNA polymerase that copies DNA that we would end up uh, with a functional chromosome. In fact, we ended up with something that was the right size, but even with the tremendous selectivity we get with uh, screening for infectious agents, which probably gives us a million-fold selectivity, uh, we ended up with nothing uh, that worked. Uh, mm-hmm. The process of DNA synthesis with... Uh, DNA synthesizers is a degenerate process. Uh, so the longer pieces you make, uh, the more errors there are in it. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. So it, when we restarted the program in 2002, uh, it, we took off uh, a while uh, for a break to sequence the human genome. Uh, when we came back to it, we started uh, uh, to tackle this prog- program in earnest Uh, and developed whole new ways uh, to accurately put pieces uh, together. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's what our publication a few years ago was uh, in 2004, where just going from the digitized uh, sequence information in the computer, we could chemically make uh, the chromosome uh, for Phi X174. But the exciting thing was when we took that piece of DNA and inserted it in E. coli, uh, e. coli used that as a template and started manufacturing virus particles. Uh, those virus particles then would kill the bacteria, and we could identify them uh, by clear plaques on a plate. Uh, we could then isolate and uh, sequence it uh, and prove uh, that it was from the synthetic uh, chromosome. Mm-hmm. That piece was only around 5,000 letters long. Uh, the mycoplasma genitalium uh, chromosome is on the order of uh, 560,000 letters or base pairs long. So orders of magnitude uh, greater problem. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I see. So um, part of um, making this whole process work um, would be actually putting uh, a genome into another cell, what you call the genome transplant. Um, Right. Now, you actually published uh, just a few months ago um, uh, a paper on how you actually did that. Um, So uh, could you talk about how you and your colleagues managed to stick a genome from one microbe into another? So there are several problems that had to be overcome. Uh, One was the chemical synthesis of the chromosome. And once we knew we could accurately make Phi X174, we knew that we could make cassettes on the order of five kilobases, which would contain roughly five genes. Uh, and then we could build up the chromosome uh, by uh, pieces of assembling uh, those cassettes. Uh, and we've been doing that over the last several years. But the real big question in my mind was not can we chemically synthesize a large piece of DNA. I knew that eventually we would be able to do that. The question is what do you do with it? How do you boot that up? Uh, with the Phi X174, the small viral DNA, it was a matter of just inserting it in E. coli, and that made the virus for us. In the case of a bacterial cell, uh, nobody has even dealt with uh, uh, moving chromosomes around the, the, even the size that we're dealing with. Uh, DNA becomes very brittle when you have larger pieces. Uh, so first off, we had to develop techniques just to... Uh, move uh, large pieces of DNA without shattering them, uh, how to isolate them from cells. Uh, But we knew to boot it up, we would probably have to put the new chromosome into a cell that maybe the chromosome had already been removed. Uh, We tried a variety of experiments, including radiation and chemical damage, trying to remove a chromosome from a bacterial cell. Uh, it's much more difficult than what happens with eukaryotes. Uh, people are aware of what happens with cloning, with, uh, for example, uh, Dolly the sheep, where you can just transplant the entire nucleus. Uh, that's not really chromosome transplantation. That's moving a whole organelle. Uh, 
uh, and it was relatively easy to do with just a dissecting uh, approach. With bacteria, there is no nucleus. There's just the uh, a free chromosome inside the cell. Uh, we also had to work out ways to get a new chromosome into the cell. So we had a team that had been working on uh, how to do chromosome transplantation. Uh, I think it was Ham Smith who had the idea that maybe we don't need to remove the chromosome uh, first in the cell we're transplanting it with, that we would uh, just try to select against that chromosome. Uh, and so we added uh, uh, to the chromosome we were transplanting uh, antibiotic uh, resistant uh, markers uh, so that we could select for cells that had the chromosome we were transplanting. Uh, but the techniques, uh, you know, probably don't need to elaborate them on them here. They're described in our paper that was in Science a short while ago of uh, how we uh, got the uh, chromosome out of uh, the donor cells into the recipient cells. But what happened next was a, a big, uh, exciting surprise to all of us uh, that we ended up with cells only with the transplanted chromosome. More importantly, all the physical characteristics of those cells completely changed from one species into another. So mm -hmm. all the proteins that were there before uh, went away. All the proteins we found in the cells were those dictated by the transplanted chromosome. All the cell surface uh, membrane antigens, all the characteristics of the cell became what was dictated just by the transplanted chromosome. So mm -hmm. to me, this is probably the single most ex important experiment in, in synthetic genomics because if we couldn't do this type of chromosome transplantation and booting up, uh, it would have just been a futile exercise in chemical synthesis. Mm. Mm. You would have just have to pack things up if this wasn't going to work. So now we know that it's all doable, uh, mm. and so it's more a question of if, not when, uh, we will be able to boot up a synthetic chromosome. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, there have been some some reports about that were claiming that you've already um, successfully put a synthetic genome in an organism, um, but I gather that they may have jumped the gun on that. I mean, where do things stand? I mean, are we talking within the year? Is this going to be happening? Yeah, the, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, some in the press keep jumping the gun on this without evidence. Uh, We've set up a pretty clear track record uh, with all our discoveries over the years that uh, uh, we try to make unequivocal announcements uh, uh, and we try to do that in conjunction uh, with a major scientific paper uh, coming out. Um, so people won't have to guess. They won't have to try and read uh, tea leaves. Uh, it was also driven by uh, a small radical NGO in Canada that sent a letter out to uh, uh, numerous people in the press claiming we were going to make an announcement uh, at our meeting last week. Uh, and instead of uh, many people in the press, as you've written about in your blog, taking the effort to try and verify that, they uh, went ahead with the story uh, based on this uh, NGO's uh, letter. Um, it, it's kind of a, a sad state of, of reporting. We, we appreciate there's a lot of excitement about what we do, but we try to be very straightforward and in how we're telegraphing things. And so we definitely have not yet uh, made uh, uh, successful transplants uh, of the synthetic chromosome into recipient cells. So we don't yet have a synthetic organism. Uh, but as I said, I feel confident based on the transplant uh, studies now, it's a, just a matter of time of getting the conditions right. Uh, they're actually quite complicated experiments uh, because uh, bacterial cells have enzymes called restriction enzymes uh, that actually protect them from this type of event happening. Uh, it makes you appreciate what restriction enzymes do when you see how you can get complete identity theft of a species into a new species uh, by a chromosome being inserted. Uh, so with different cell types, we have to overcome what are called restriction barriers uh, these enzymes that recognize foreign DNA. Uh, so they're not simple experiments, uh, but we do, uh, because of the transplant study, know that uh, they're doable. Uh, I've said several times it's, uh, it's weeks to months away. Uh, because these cells are very slow growing, uh, it takes about six weeks to do each experiment. Uh, 
Uh, so it's not like we just do a uh, E. coli transformation and know the next day uh, what the answer is. Uh, but uh, I, I feel very confident uh, that in the next uh, several months uh, we will definitely have this working. Mm. So um, once you're able to get a, a kind of a, a minimal se- synthetic cell alive, up and running, um, what would you like to do? I mean, what would you like, uh, aside from asking these, these very basic questions, what kind of applications would you like to use this for? Well, o- over time, we began to think about uh, this technology that we were developing And as you say, aside from trying to answer some of these key questions about basic cell biology uh, and basic genomics, so once we know it works, uh, I I think it's a big shift in thinking uh, because then uh, thousands of experiments uh, become doable uh, that right now there's a a key barrier to doing because uh, until it's done once successfully, uh, the rest is just hypothetical. Uh, But the, the minimal cell we're making uh, based on mycoplasma genitalium is simply to ask uh, some of these very basic questions and for proof of concept. Uh, we don't think it's a good organism uh, uh, to build on, uh, for example, industrial applications. But when you think about the concept, and, and for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, my team has been leading uh, much of the way with what we call digitizing biology. We've been reading the genetic code of species, going from this analog world of biology into the digital code of the computer. Uh, Our Sorcerer 2 expedition uh, uh, earlier this year in PLOS Biology, we published in a single paper uh, the description of 6 million new genes that we discovered that more than doubled all the genes in the public domain. Uh, and I like to think of these genes as the design components of the future. Uh, mm-hmm. Within a year, we'll probably have a database of 20 million uh, genes. When you think of the electronics industry in the 1950s, there was a very finite number of components uh, that almost all electrical devices are built out of. Uh, we have resistors, capacitors, and transistors, uh, to name a few, but uh, there's not a whole lot more than that. Uh, with uh, 10 to 20 million design components, basically in synthetic biology, we're more limited by our imaginations than we are by uh, the complexities of biology. So we began to think of what would be really important applications. Uh, the number one thing we've been working on that, in fact, led to the Sorcerer 2 expedition is, I think, the biggest issue facing humanity is what we're doing to our environment. Uh, and if we don't change that sooner or later, we're sort of playing uh, Russia and roulette with our planet. Uh, we put right now three and a half billion tons of CO2 a year into the atmosphere, the majority of that coming from burning fossil fuels. Uh, the estimations are as we go from six billion to nine billion people uh, over the next 40 years or so, uh, that that number will increase up to 200 billion tons of CO2 a year going into the atmosphere with the industrialization of India and China uh, and other developing parts of the world. Uh, We're playing uh, dangerous games where we could have, as some people predicted, just a uh, catastrophic uh, shift. Uh, For example, uh, worried about things like the Gulf Stream uh, stopping, uh, which keeps uh, much of Europe out of the ice ages. Uh, we've seen evidence of uh, uh, Greenland uh, perhaps melting. Uh, we have a lot of major concerns, and people think, well, this just affects uh, coastal waters. When you look at uh, the bread baskets of our nation, uh, the major uh, valleys in California, uh, it's estimated within 50 years California could have half the snowfall and therefore half the water available for agriculture. Uh, So it's not just a matter of, you know, oceanfront property. It's a question, can we uh, produce uh, food uh, to feed uh, the ever-increasing populations, uh, the risk of increasing diseases, et cetera. So 
we've been looking for biological solutions to alternatives for burning oil and coal, uh, and we think we have uh, several. Fortunately, several other groups are working on the same thing. The sooner uh, there's some uh, solutions, I think the better it will be. Hmm. Um, I mean, what do you think about the concerns that people have that, <clears throat> you know, that we're sort of leaping forward into potentially making new kinds of life um, without a sort of, um, without kind of a broad social discussion about it, without strict government regulation. So, um, you know, people worry that the kind of things that you're doing might be turned, some, someone might be able to turn it into a biological weapon, for example. Um, so how do you view the, the, kind of the ethical dimension of what you and others are doing? I think it's, uh, it's something we take extremely seriously, and I, I think what we've done in synthetic genomics, possibly for the first time in scientific history, is ask some of the ethical questions before we started the first experiments. And those are continually ongoing. We're about to issue uh, the report based on two years of study funded by the Sloan Foundation uh, to look at the risk uh, associated with synthetic genomics and and biological warfare and what laboratory practices and what governments should perhaps uh, do in, in terms of, for example, uh, monitoring uh, uh, the companies that make uh, the synthetic pieces of DNA uh, to make sure that nobody's ordering things on the uh, most infectious uh, biological warfare agents list, uh, for example. Uh, the conclusions of much of this work is that, well, uh, almost any virus that has been accurately sequenced, which may be not too many of them, and accuracy is important if you're relying on what's in the uh, public databases as your source of building things, uh, that uh, there's plenty of other sources of most of these agents, uh, and it's not clear that anybody would try to develop the skill set uh, to go through this extremely complex uh, technical work at this stage, but uh, my view is it's the same issue that we're facing with new emerging infections. Uh, SARS, mm -hmm. HIV are all recent, uh, uh, certainly in, in my lifetime, and as we go from six to nine billion people, I think it's inevitable that we will have many more new emerging infections. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're dying from a virus, I don't think it matters a whole lot whether it's man-made or occurring because of overpopulation and, and unhealthy conditions, we need new antivirals, we need new antibiotics, we need new vaccines, uh, and, and neither our government nor our pharmaceutical and biotech industry are making much uh, effort in that regard. Uh, companies like Eli Lilly have canceled their antimicrobial programs uh, apparently because they can make more money by treating chronic diseases uh, than short-term infections. And this is a trend we're seeing. So I think uh, we as a nation uh, and other nations as well need to do something about reversing this uh, because, as most people know, we have now um, completely antibiotic-resistant uh, Staph aureus and other infectious agents uh, uh, we need to constantly come up with new uh, treatments, new therapies to even stay even in the war against microbes. Um, mm. We go through these bottlenecks in history. In 1969, the U.S. Surgeon General said we won the war against microbe, uh, and microbial infections and antimicrobial programs began to shut down uh, uh, around the world. Uh, we need to reverse that, whether it is due to uh, people worried about synthetic biology uh, or new emerging infections. Mm. Um, the, the last question I had um, sort of has to do with, I guess it's kind of a philosophical question. Um, you know, it, I, I've been interested in this question of, you know, what is life, which is a question obviously that's been asked for a long time, but I think scientists like yourself are... Um, approaching it from a new direction by actually being able to manipulate life and maybe even create it. Um, and I was just wondering what it's like for you 
as a scientist to be potentially on the verge of creating these synthetic organisms and and what you think it can tell us about just what it means to be alive? I, look, I think it's a great question and uh, uh, I try to deal with it to some extent in my book, A Life Decoded, uh, both in terms of my experiences in Vietnam, uh, trying to understand uh, what actually killed or kept people alive there, uh, to uh, the notion that we can potentially make synthetic life. Uh, I, I think it changes some of our views about maybe what uh, uh, what life is. Uh, my personal thinking is that uh, living entities are going to be ubiquitous throughout the universe, uh, and that life is one of uh, uh, the basic uh, properties of the universe, that when you get the right elements together, uh, we spontaneously end up uh, with living entities. Uh, the latest uh, numbers that I've heard is in our own galaxy, we have uh, 100,000 Earth and super-Earth uh, uh, planets uh, capable of life. Uh, so we have almost an infinite chance uh, in uh, the universe of having life occur. I I'm sure that if we could uh, travel around the universe, we would find similar base life uh, yeah, everywhere we were able to look, uh, and that life is one of the basic uh, uh, properties of existence uh, of the entire uh, universe. That being said, we're finding it extremely difficult to define uh, what's that uh, seemingly magical point when you have these inert uh, chemical entities uh, working together uh, to have now something that's living and, and capable of self-duplication uh, and self-generation. Uh, I asked similar questions in Vietnam about uh, uh, people that had just small uh, bullet wounds uh, just affecting a tiny part of their brain. You know, how did that kill all 100 trillion cells uh, when it was just a tiny uh, portion? So I don't think we've yet uh, managed to successfully define life. We're, we're having the same trouble with the term species from all the things we're finding in the ocean, all these very closely related organisms with minor variants in their genetic code. Uh, some people say uh, even a single gene difference is there for a new species. Some have argued it should be 10% different or more in the genetic code, but that makes us the same species as most mammals, uh, so we probably don't <laughs> like that notion. Um, for our purposes, uh, in terms of synthetic genomics, we're using self-replication as part of our definition, but that's clearly not uh, necessary. We as humans are not self-replicating. Uh, we can have uh, bacterial cells that are alive and not replicating, but I think uh, for the definitions at this stage, we're making uh, that uh, clearly an aspect of it. Uh, we don't consider a virus alive because it cannot self-replicate. It has to actually infect another living entity uh, in order to do that. Um, it, it may be uh, something as mundane as the difference between uh, before and after uh, we start an automobile engine. Uh, the parts all working together uh, with a certain amount of energy input uh, uh, lead to uh, a continuous activity. Um, I think it's not going to be as mysterious in the end uh, and that if we have the right units to put together, uh, that humans will be able to create life. Uh, and I think that changes a lot of concepts. Yeah, I think it will. Well, this has been a really great time, and, and thank you for you know, sp spending all this time talking about, about your work here on, on Blogging Heads. Well, it's nice to be with you, Carl, and uh, we, we always appreciate the quality of your reporting.